Hi there, I'm Teresa Crimmins, Director of the USA National Phonology Network. And along with my colleagues, I'm Alyssa Rose Martin, Kathy Gerson, Aaron Postumus. I'm presenting Putting Short-Term Phonology Forecasts on the Map. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, phonology is an old-fashioned word for a phenomenon we are all really pretty familiar with. It refers to when things happen seasonally. Things like when do different species of plants put on their leaves or flowers in the spring, when do birds migrate, and when do insects hatch. And we care about phonology or when these things happen because they can vary dramatically from year to year in response to local environmental conditions. And they are changing in response to changing climate conditions. Um, maybe most relevant for this, this audience is that understanding when things are likely to occur from year to year or within a season can really help with more effectively planning when you might want to undertake different management actions. So things like if you, if you know that it's a particularly late spring or summer in a given year because it's been cool, it, it's likely that invasive species like purple loosestrife may be flowering later in the season and you may have a longer window of time to try and treat it or uproot it before it goes to flower and to seed and is therefore not a good thing to be doing. So because understanding, having a better understanding of when stuff is happen happening seasonally and how that is changing, the USA National Phenology Network was established back in 2007 with the primary aim of collecting, storing, and sharing information and data on when stuff is happening, phonology, uh, both to support fundamental science and discovery, as well as to support management decisions. And in particular, we're especially interested in identifying situations where you may be able to make a better, more informed decision if you had a better understanding of when a particular thing might happen, and specifically when a particular species may undergo a transition from one state to another. And so we're working closely with a whole wide range of um, sectors and decision makers to try to, to hone in on what should we be making data products and, and in particular forecasts of to support decision making. One of the big things that we do is manage a program called Nature's Notebook, which is, if you've heard the word citizen science or community science, it is that, meaning that um, thousands, tens of thousands of volunteers across the country participate. But the program is also used by um, scientists and uh, a lot of agency personnel for the purpose of keeping track of when stuff happens. You can track about 1400 species of plants and animals through this program. And we offer extensive training and support for getting going on this, as well as very ready, ready data access. There's 23 million records of uh, plant and animal phenology data now available through this program. And very, very briefly, um, I can talk offline more, much more about this program if you're interested. Basically how it works is that individuals, when you participate, are going out and making repeated observations on the same individual plants over the course of the year and hopefully over multiple years. And each time you're making an observation, you're answering a series of yes, no questions about what you see. And you can do this either using a mobile app um, or paper data sheets. Another big activity that we do is to generate these more derived data products that are intended to help meet the needs for this phonology information. Again, if there's something in particular that you need to know that will help you, plan and execute your job better. That's really what we're in the business of trying to identify and execute. So what I'm showing here are um, data products that we make available on a daily basis and six days into the future that indicate accumulated growing degree days or how much warmth has been accumulated since January 1st. And these maps are made available on two different base temperatures um, and are both available as the maps of accumulated warmth, like you see on the left, as well as anomalies, meaning departure from average. Um, and in this case, we compare the current year to the climatological average 1981 to 2010 to see how a particular year is, is shaping up. And so what you see here are the maps from May 12th of this particular year. And the map on the right is showing that we had a whole lot of warmth way ahead of schedule across much of the South and Southeast uh, this particular year. 
And these maps are available as static maps, as well as raster data products and image files on our website, and also through a interactive visualization tool where you can go in and drop a pin on a particular location and get a sense for what that heat accumulation curve looks like at, at, at that location. And so this, this plot is from a location in the Boston area from this past winter and spring. And the black line is what the long-term heat accumulation, the average conditions usually look like. And the blue line is this year. And you can see that relative to average, this year was way ahead of schedule, pretty much out of the gate since January 1st. Whereas the orange line, which is last year, um, was pretty average. Accumulated growing degree days are a useful measure in and of themselves, but they're actually extra useful when they can be interpreted relative to established growing degree day thresholds, which is a pretty common practice in the agriculture and integrated pest management fields, where um, in, folks have established experimentally how much warmth does an organism need to be exposed to in order to transition from one state to another. And so, for example, how much does a insect need to be um, exposed to until it will go from one instar stage to the next? We've, we've tried to identify species for which it's especially useful to know when a particular life cycle stage will be reached because it's important for management. And so, and so what we do then is take those growing degree day maps that I showed in the previous slide, um, compare them to these established thresholds, and then deliver what we call phenoforecast maps. The phenoforecast map that you're looking at here is for emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borers are really problematic, as I know you know, decimating ash trees all across the country. And they're tricky to control because they spend much of their life cycle under the bark of the tree, so they're inaccessible and they're just doing damage but they, they emerge as adults at around 450 growing degree days. And then there's about a two week window before they start laying eggs. And so that window is actually a, a really good opportunity to try to control them to prevent them from laying eggs and spreading to new trees. And so if you can anticipate when for 450 to growing degree days is going to be reached at your site and therefore adults will be emerging, you can use that to help plan your control activities. And so that's what we what, that's what we do here, and that's what we're showing in this map. Um, this map is from March 15th of this past year, and the locations that are showing up in yellow are the locations that have recently crossed that 450 growing degree day threshold, and where we predicted that adult uh, adults are flying around right now. And this is your opportunity to take a, to take try to take action to control them. Locations that are in the tan have already passed the, that that window, and green and purple locations have not yet achieved it. And so you can use these maps and reference them on a frequent basis because they're updating daily to try to get a sense for, are you running up on that window? Or are you getting close? Uh, you can explore these on our website and through the visualization tool again, where you can zoom in and pan and explore other things. And you can also sign up to receive email-based notifications for your specific location uh, that are triggered by the heat accumulation. And so if you go in and sign up for these, you will get emailed a notification when um, it's about two weeks out from when we think the threshold is going to be hit, then another week out, and then when you actually reach it. We've extended this, we make those phenol forecasts available for 12 different problematic insect species. And then we've extended that, that approach also to an invasive grass um, in Arizona, which responds in the summertime, it, it greens up in response to uh, monsoon rainfall. Um, and the reason why this is important is that this invasive grass, buffalo grass, um, is a real problem for, it, it, it introduces fire into desert ecosystems that are not fire adapted. It is best controlled with herbicide after it greens up, um, but it greens up very patchily across the landscape because our summer monsoon rainfalls are so patchy. And so managers here express to us, if you can tell us where, where the buffalo grass is gonna be green when, that would really help us in, in um, dispatching crews and being more efficient in our treatment. And so what we do here, similar to the other phenol forecasts for insects, we use daily precipitation information to indicate um, which locations seem to have uh, received 
sufficient rainfall within a, a, a two or three week window that might trigger green up in that plant and that it would be appropriate for a treatment with the herbicide. Um, the maps are working reasonably well. Um, we have identified that the coarse spatial resolution of the prism data that we're using to generate these maps is limiting us to some extent. And then another thing is that a lot of the data points that we've been using for validation happen to be along roadsides and the roadside plants green up more quickly than out in the in the middle of open areas because of the runoff of rainfall from um, from from the roads and so we're, we're going to work on refining um, these maps based on road buffers in the coming months and years so how are pheno forecasts being used well um, these maps have been picked up fairly frequently by university extension in a number of states, as well as tree care and forestry organizations like Casey Trees in Washington, D.C. and the Arbor Day Foundation. Um, we've also seen them be circulated through organizations like the USDA Climate Hubs for better understanding management needs and um, planning for control. And also an organization like this one we saw um, on Twitter, Mass Pests. So here are the species that we have available. We currently have phenol forecasts available for, and because it's fall, we are now starting to think about what species we may want to extend this functionality to encompass for the coming year. And so if you have species for which, either plants or animals for which, it would be helpful for you to know when they are going to undergo different life cycle transitions, I invite you to please share your thoughts with us. Our strongest interest is to be generating this kind of information based on end users' needs. And so to understand, you know, is it helpful to know when some particular thing might happen really drives uh, what we prioritize. And so, for example, along, following that, that line of thinking, we're working with the USDA Climate Hubs, we will be delivering a phenol forecast for winter wheat next spring not because it's a species that we need to control, but rather because it's frost sensitive at different um, life cycle stages. And to be able to understand where it likely is developmentally on any given day across the, the country or wherever it's being planted is really helpful for, for, for managers uh, to better assess the potential for um, frost damage. So I welcome you to check out the resources that I very briefly mentioned here today. Um, you might want to check out Nature's Notebook because it is a great program and uh, system for tracking and managing um, data and information about phenology at your site. And this is used by not only individuals for this purpose, but um, the National Ecological Observatory Network, National Park Service, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and dozens of other, hundreds of other organizations. Um, or you may be just interested in the data themselves, and there are, again, 23 million records available. Um, you may want to check out the phenol forecast maps because they could help you in your management activities. Give us your feedback on additional species you'd like to see phenol forecasts constructed for. And finally, I invite you to check out and sign up for the NPN's newsletters because this is the best way to stay abreast of the many opportunities that we actually have that I didn't mention here. So thank you so much for your time and I invite you to follow up if you have questions. There's my email and I'm also available on Twitter. And on behalf of the entire USA and team, thank you. Have a great day.